Life is not a performance. Life is not an obligation. Life is not a dress rehearsal. Life is an adventure. And I contend that especially if you want to be an outlier in life, and if you want to live an exciting and meaningful life, you need to treat life like an adventure. And if life is an adventure, what attitudes do you need to take towards life? Imagine tomorrow morning, you get up, you pack your bags, you go to Hong Kong airport, and you jump on a plane, and you fly north for six hours until you arrive in Mongolia. Then you get off the plane, you take the bag, you jump on a train, you take the train into the middle of the Gobi Desert, get off the train, and then you take your bag and you decide, instead of catching a plane to go home, you're going to walk back home to Hong Kong. <laughs> if you did that, what kind of adventures would you have along the way? What kind of people would you meet along the way? What kind of attitudes of adventure would you need in order to survive and even thrive along the way? Well, that's what I did just over a year ago. I, I left my home and my wife in Hong Kong. I flew up to Mongolia with a load of stuff and I walked back to Hong Kong. It uh, took me about six months, about 5,000 kilometers, around about 10 million steps until I finally got back. So today I'm going to tell you a few stories of what happened along the way and I'm going to share some of these attitudes of adventure which I think helped me to get through it all. And I will also reflect a little bit on how those attitudes, I think, can help us with whatever our own personal adventure is in life. So this is the day uh, I set off, that's me, and my friend Leon, who is also a professional cameraman, and we were making a TV show for National Geographic along the way. Uh, we jumped on the plane, we flew over the Gobi Desert, uh, as I looked out of the window, I calculated in my head that for about every two minutes we were on the plane, it would take us about a whole day of walking, which rather put um, life in perspective. Next time you complain about a plane journey, think about that. And um, we got down to a little town called Sainshad in the Gobi Desert, which was our start line, and we packed our bags for the final time. We had a lot of stuff with us. This was a winter expedition, and so we had lots of warm clothes, tents, sleeping bags, cooking equipment, all that kind of stuff. Because we were filming it professionally, we had two big cameras, four small cameras, a laptop, four hard drives, a pile of cables, and a load of batteries. Because we were about to walk across a desert and there weren't very many 7-Elevens out there, uh, we had to take eight days' worth of food and water with us, and hopefully we'd be able to resupply a little bit as we went. Um, and all of that amounted to about 100 kilograms, which is like four times your check-in baggage, a lot to carry across a desert. And so actually now I have to introduce you to the third member of the expedition who was Molly Brown. <laughs> this is Molly Brown. Molly Brown um, was our trailer. We loaded her up with stuff and we set off walking south into the desert. And my first attitude of adventure I wanted to share was that we need, on our adventures in life, we need to set ourselves specific Gold. We need, I needed, on this expedition, a long-term goal. I was trying to get to Hong Kong. It was great to have that as my ultimate goal. But if I, I only ever thought about getting to Hong Kong, that would be a very depressing thought on my first day. I had a very long way to go. So I needed medium-term goals. Where am I trying to get this week? And I needed a short-term goal. What is my goal for today? How many kilometres do I need to walk today in order to be on track for that grand goal? One of the great things about uh, walking across a desert is that you can just camp wherever you like. You don't have to ask permission from the local farmer to camp in their field. You just put your tents up anywhere. And uh, this was our second night in the desert. And one of the daily routines we had to practice was stretching. Because I knew if I was going to fail on this expedition, one of the most likely ways I might fail would be if I got injured. 
And one of the best ways to prevent injury is to do loads of stretching. One of those small acts of discipline you have to do, because walking, especially when you've got a lot of weight, is, is very likely to injure you. And so that's my second attitude of adventure, is uh, to practice the small acts of discipline. On the expedition, stretching was one of those key disciplines for me. Um, but in normal life, I find I also have to have practice really key disciplines. At the moment, I'm writing a book, and I find one of the most crucial small acts of discipline every day is to disable my internet before I start work. In fact, sometimes I even get my wife to hide the router before she goes to work, so I can't check my email. And that's a small act of discipline. It transforms how well I can progress that day. I'm sure there are ways you can think about that for your lives. If you're trying to study, maybe leave your iPhone at home and so you're not checking your Facebook account every five minutes. Um, and another thing, I suppose, more in a professional sphere, I've found a small act of discipline is things like courtesy. I've found it's such a small thing, but it makes such a difference to working relationships. Things like uh, sending a thank you or writing a thank you card to people uh, when, when you should do. Small act of discipline makes a huge difference. Onwards we went through the desert. On our third day, we encountered these guys standing uh, ahead of us. They're big creatures. We got a little bit closer. I saw they were Bactrian camels. And they weren't completely wild. They were owned by somebody, but they were being left to graze on their own. And as we walked closer, I said to Leon, um, why don't we walk through the middle of them? We can film, it will be great. And I grew up on a sit in a city, so I don't know a lot about animals. Leon grew up on a farm. He said, don't walk through the middle of them. As we got closer, we saw they were very big, and they were starting to stomp towards us, rather territorially. And so we took this wide berth, managed to get around the camels uh, without getting trampled. <laughs> Onwards we went, and then on our sixth day, the snow started to arrive. It's, it was uh, the beginning of winter, it was November time. It had been about minus 10 as we started going, which was uh, endurable. But now the temperature was dropping lower and lower. It only snows twice a year in the Gobi, but it snowed in our first week. And the temperature now dropped down to about minus 20. If you're interested to know what that feels like, a little experiment you can do at home. Um, just remember this now. You open your freezer door, put your hand in to get your ice cream out of your freezer. That's about minus 20 in your freezer at home. So imagine that, and then just imagine keeping your hand in there for about six months. And, so, <laughs> and you're beginning to get an idea of a Mongolian winter. Actually, this is only the beginning of winter. It was going to get a lot colder. And there are all sorts of problems when it gets cold like this. Firstly, you um, just feel cold, you have to keep moving, wear lots of clothes. But there are other things, everything starts to freeze, our water bottles start to freeze. So when I was cooking, you can see I'm cooking here, we found our water bottles were frozen solid. We just had to cut them open and put the ice into the pan. And then I'd um, crunch up some instant noodles, put the instant noodles in the pan. And then I tried to put our tin of beef into the, the pan, but the tin of beef had also frozen, so I couldn't get the tin opener into it, and so it was frozen solid, so I had to put the whole tin into the pot, and then the instant noodles started to burn, and the ice started to melt, and I managed to open the, the, um, the, the tin of beef, which tasted and looked a little bit like dog food, and, I put it in, and then the noodles were burnt, I mixed it up a bit, so we had burnt noodles and half-frozen dog food. It didn't look great, but it, it filled us up. Inside the tent, other problems with the cold, your breath starts to freeze onto the surface of the tent, the moisture, and then every time you turn over in the middle of the night, you get this kind of uh, little uh, load of ice falling into your face, not very pleasant in the winter. But we had to keep going, we had to persevere, it was tough, it was cold, it was painful, it was exhausting, a bit frightening, but we had to keep going. And that leads me on to my next point, my next attitude of adventure. Um, but before I, I tell you the answer, the answer to all your problems, I wanted to just reflect back on an experience I had when I was a student, about your age, in my summer holidays. I used to be a door-to-door -door salesman in America for my summer holidays, going around knocking on doors in California, trying to sell children's books to families in California. And as you can imagine, door-to-door -door sales is quite a soul-destroying job in some ways. You're knocking, lots of people saying, no thanks, not interested, no thanks, not interested, no thanks, not interested. And 
After I'd been doing that for a little while, I just felt like sitting down on the pavement and crying. In fact, on one occasion, I did sit, sit down on the pavement and cry. It was so um, soul-destroying doing this. And my sales manager, I spoke to my sales manager, a very wise guy, and he said to me, Rob, the answer to all your problems is to knock on another door. Not to sit on the pavement crying, not to feel sorry for yourself. Knock on another door. So I got up, I knocked on another door. Still weren't interested. I knocked on another one. Still weren't interested. But I kept on knocking, and it wasn't long before I met somebody who did want my books. And so the answer to all my problems I had to remember was to knock on another door. On this expedition, when I felt like giving up or complaining too much, I had to remember the answer to all my problems is to walk another 10 kilometers. And if I still didn't feel better, the answer to all my problems is to walk another 10 kilometers. And the chances are I would start feeling better, or maybe I would meet somebody nice who would look after me, or something else. I might see some camels, something to cheer me up. And I think it's the same in real life. We have to think about what do we, sometimes we just need to keep on going. We need to focus on what we really need to do. At the moment, writing a book, I find when I when the book's going really badly, I have to remind myself the answer to all my problems is just to write for another eight hours, and I'll probably start feeling better. Maybe when you're studying, it's the same. The answer to all your problems, make sure your iPhone's off, and just make sure you study for another eight hours, and you'll start, things will start to improve again. Well, sure enough, as we walked along, we did meet some more helpful um, things to boost our morale, because we saw some goats, and we saw a guy on a camel, and he invited us back to his gear, a gear or a yurt, in the middle of the desert. We were invited inside, he introduced us to his family, and um, actually, as we went through the desert, we met countless very, very hospitable, kind people who would often invite us in, and sometimes even let us stay the night with them in the gear, or if they had a spare gear in their spare gear, so we could recover. And that leads me to the next attitude of adventure, which is you don't have to make it on your own. We live in a very individualistic society. I think sometimes we think we have to do everything by ourselves. But I've found in my experience, I've cycled through over 30 countries, walked through quite a few countries as well during my life, and I've found <coughs> everywhere from Afghanistan to Papua New Guinea, i found nearly everybody I meet is very, very friendly and helpful along the way. And I think it's important that we are prepared to go ask our friends for advice, find professional people to ask for advice. Don't always try and do everything on our own. We made it eventually out of the desert. We crossed the Chinese border and we actually got rid of Molly now, sadly. We had to leave Molly behind. And so now we just had our rucksacks, about 25 kg in each rucksack. We didn't need quite as much food because there are more towns in China. Uh, but it was hard work as we pressed on. Temperatures still around minus 20, minus 30. There were a lot of roads. There were railways to walk along. Sometimes we just walked cross country. Um, but, and Inner Mongolia, Inner Mongolia is a province in northern China. Inner Mongolia, there's a lot of development going on, so there were more people around. We saw this sign one day pointing into this bit of wasteland. It's a whole new industrial development being built in the middle of nowhere in Inner Mongolia. And it's amazing to see the development. We all hear about it all the time. There's this, the city of Jinning. Uh, one day we were walking along, we saw this... Uh, factory chimney and a big bank of clouds. We thought maybe more snow was on the way. And then we got round the corner and we found the big blank bank of clouds was just a factory. Um, um, quite extraordinary. Pressed on south. Uh, this was my favourite shop sign I saw in uh, England. Honey, lovely mother and baby's article life club. I think they might have used the Google Translate for that one. And we were heading back into the wilderness now. Um, and heading for the beautiful Great Wall of China in a rather untouristy section, rather different to the Great Wall everybody goes to see near Beijing, just this huge tamped earth line heading through the mountains. Very hard, slow work. Sometimes there would be gullies, which we'd have to walk right down into, then right up out of. I don't know if you can see me. Spot me in that uh, picture. I'm there. So you can see the kids. <laughs> Big wall. We, sometimes we were only moving about one kilometre an hour at this point. The people in this region of China, in Shaanxi province, live in uh, Yaodongs, ca cave houses. They're little cave houses built into the side of the mountains, and again, often they would look after us. 
Leon was starting to lose the skin on his fingers. It's not frostbite, but it's not much fun. Because um, he was filming all the time. Poor Leon had to hold this freezing cold camera. We made it, the, the Great Wall led us to the Yellow River, which was entirely frozen over. We headed south down the Yellow River, walking along the banks, the scree slopes, the cliffs above it, until um, we made it back onto a road. And now our diet had changed. We were very happy. Now it was still instant noodles, but instant noodles and processed sausage. Um, brilliant. Only cost about one kwai for a uh, processed sausage in China. So that was uh, our new diet. Uh, and it was now approaching Chinese New Year. It was J January the 21st, 2012. And as we, um, as we were walking into a city on the night of Chinese New Year, we found uh, we were feeling very lonely. We didn't know anyone in the city. It, everybody was letting off fireworks in their houses, eating Chinese New Year's Eve meal. Everybody was having celebrations. And me and Leon were walking through minus 25 feeling very lonely. And then suddenly a car pulled up next to us and a guy said, come back to my house for dinner. And so we shared Chinese New Year with this wonderful Chinese family, lots of dump dumplings with Canadian ice wine. And uh, over the next few days, lots and lots of celebrations to see in this interior region of China. Back to the Yellow River. Um, a few blisters developing now. I'll skip from that one. And my final attitude of adventure before we, we kind of take her home is that sometimes in life we really need to make sure that we celebrate being alive. Because sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in our goals, in our ambitions, in our what we want to achieve in our life, in our expedition, whatever it is. And it's hard work and working hard. And we forget to celebrate being alive. And for me, I love doing things like jumping in rivers um, or running in the mountains. That really makes me feel alive. And as you go through life, I'm sure a lot of you have got some great ambitions, but remember to celebrate being alive. Cultivate some great hobbies. And can I humbly suggest just going to the shopping mall every weekend is not a great hobby, uh, which will make you feel alive. Cultivate some great, healthy, life-giving hobbies. Um, cultivate some deep friendships. That's what life is all about. It's not all about just big ambitions. Well, onwards we went through Xi'an, and now the spring and then the summer was starting to arrive. Leon and I cracked onwards, walking 30, 40 kilometres a day. The farmers were out um, uh, farming their fields. We made it to the Yangtze. We jumped in that river too. We were getting very exhausted. We were going slightly insane. We sometimes had to look out for a few snakes. This one's actually dead. Um, <laughs> we didn't kill it. It was run over on the road. Uh, we went through Guilin. Uh, the rain started to arrive. Leon started to think he was actually a Jedi Knight. <laughs> we made it down to Guangzhou, across the Pearl River, and uh, went for a quick swim in that, probably the dirtiest river in China, not a very good idea. Um, and across Lo Wu border, probably the most ugly border in the world. Nathan Road, and then finally back to my beautiful wife Christine uh, on the Kowloon motorcycle. And as I finish, um, I just had a couple of things to say. First of all, life is not a performance, life is not a dress rehearsal, life is not an obligation, life is an adventure, and we need to live life as an adventure to have these attitudes to set specific goals, practice small acts of discipline. Uh, remember the answer to all your problems is to walk another 10 kilometers. You don't have to make it on your own and we have to celebrate being alive. And as I close, I just wanted to say, when I was your age at university, I was not the smartest guy in the room. I wasn't the guy getting top marks in all the exams. I wasn't the strongest guy in the room. I wasn't the guy in the top sports teams. And I wasn't the bravest guy in the room. I wasn't the kind of guy who, well, I, I used to get frightened of things very easily. And if I'm honest, I still do get frightened of things very easily. So I wanted to say, live your life as an adventure. Take these attitudes of adventure. And even if you don't think you're the smartest, the bravest, the strongest, don't let that hold you back. Live your life 
as an adventure. Thank you very much.